Uh, so good morning. Thank you, Dr. Hartle, for the warm introduction. I said, my name is Camille Molina. Um, spent the majority of my, basically, actually all of my medical and surgical training at uh, Johns Hopkins uh, Medical School Residency and currently in my fellowship. And uh, today I'm going to talk about this project that we've been working on for many years now. I think we started uh, working on this in 2014. <clears throat> and the title of the project, as you can see, has to do with the accuracy and the precision of pedicle screw placement. Um, but the reality of why we're discussing augmented reality in the context and the framing of accuracy and precision of a, a pedicle screw placement is because that's the common currency and the language uh, that everybody in this room understands in terms of validating a navigation system amongst ourselves and amongst our peers and industry and regulators. Uh, but uh, I hope that you can see in this talk that our aim was not to create a better system for placement of pedicle screws because the reality is that everybody in this room is an expert at putting pedicle screws in one shape or another, freehand, fluoro, uh, robotic, computer navigated, whatever you want. This is We're doing this quite well and whether it's orthopedic or neurosurgery already. So we didn't, we're not creating a solution for something that isn't broken, but this is the barrier to entry to creating a whole new navigational system. So as a disclosure, um, a part of the uh, original team startup at the uh, Augmentics, the company that, that makes the technology that we're going to discuss that uh, took over some of the research that uh, was able to start off this project. So we're all familiar, you know, with the uh, remote uh, two-dimensional display that uh, most people use in the conventional uh, com uh, manual computer navigated uh, OR surgical suite. And we know we've heard multiple times today from some of the people who um, have discussed augmented reality, Dr. Witham, um, about the technical drawbacks of some of this line of sight interruption. You know, you're working with a remote tracking camera that is really only able to see the uh, reference frame on the patient and the tra uh, and the tracking of the instrument, but is not actually seeing the patient and it's not directly over your surgical field. We know that it has some learning curve uh, difficulties uh, <clears throat> for people who are new adopters. And there's also a risk that people who are only learning how to use this type of technology won't actually know how to do freehand instrumentation. And we've heard multiple times about the risks of attention shift or of always looking at a remote display, but not actually paying attention to your patient and uh, how that has many uh, potential pitfalls in the misplacement of instrumentation. <clears throat> and despite you know the newer technology such as robotics, we're still seeing that people are not actually looking at their field, but they're focused on a remote screen without uh, seeing if what the, uh, without reconciling what is happening in their surgical field to what is actually happening on that remote screen. <clears throat> so, uh, what I really hope that <clears throat> people get at the end of this talk is not that we have a better system for placement of pedicle screws, but that we created a whole new surgical navigation system that does not have to use that traditional NDI camera that all the other navigational systems pretty much third party license that is limited in accuracy by its distance remotely away from that tracking frame and the tool that you're navigating. Our tracking camera is directly mounted on this headset along with a surgical headlight and the entire processing power is built into the headset. So we've miniaturized an entire surgical navigation workstation into the small headset. And that gives us improved accuracy and precision as I'll show you today because one of the main factors in the precision and accuracy of all these navigational systems one of the main variables is the distance from that tracking camera remotely to the uh, reference frame on the patient and your tool. And the fact that it's sitting directly over the patient not only gives us improved accuracy and precision, but opens a door to a whole new other host of possibilities. These are smart, advanced, high resolution tracking cameras that are going to be able to do surface active matching registration to the patient. So that you're not only doing infrared tracking, but actual live surface match tracking so that you can see active movements and deformity corrections being um, giving you objective data back into your uh, head mounted display uh, using artificial intelligence and machine learning to guide your osteotomies, your decompression, do <clears throat> um, soft tissue and uh, CT overlay so that you can see where the neural structures are, uh, where you can guide your tumor resections, et cetera. So this talk is not about pedicle screw placement. It's really about validating the accuracy of the system through pedicle screw placement so that people, to get it in people's hands and the possibilities are potentially endless with this. Dr. Witham talked about our data uh, that we had originally published during an open uh, cadaveric trial, 120 pedicle screws, depending on which scale you use. If you use Gertzbein, 94.7% accuracy. Heary scale, 96.7% accuracy. 
we compared it to robotics and manual computer navigation, and we found that we're not inferior. But that was a prior version of our system, and we were small, so we can pivot quickly, and we wanted to make the system better since then. Uh, so we made improvements, and we gave ourselves an even bigger challenge, which was to do it fully percutaneous so that the surgeon did not have their additional you know, anatomic landmarks to uh, give help to the system if they found that it wasn't exactly giving them the correct navigation. <clears throat> so uh, this October, we went to Rush, did a fully percutaneous study, improved our 3D segmentation of the spine. And what you see through the headset, and actually I'll back here to this image, you have the surgeon looking directly over the patient, and what you're going to see when you're doing that percutaneously, you're going to see a 3D model of, your, of that spine through that, through these see-through lenses, directly overlaid over the patient's real anatomy. And then you're also going to have floating sagittal and axial projections of your tool trajectory. Uh, and this works incredibly seamlessly, and uh, people who get used to it in a very small period of time are able to uh, very efficiently uh, guide their uh, hardware trajectories. So to do the study, we used five cadaveric torsos. We attached the registration clamp at L2. We used both the Aero and the Zeem 3D image acquisition systems to get, get our intraop 3D images. We instrumented the cadavers from T5 to S1. We uh, placed a total of 113 total implants, 20 of which were jammed sheeting needles. 93 of them were pedicle screws. Pedicle screws varied in width, 5.5 millimeters for the thoracic, 6.5 millimeters for the lumbar, and the jam sheet needles had an 11 French gauge. Here's a picture of the reference frame uh, that we attached to get the intraoperative uh, uh, 3D image acquisition. We replaced the Z marker, is what we call it, with the actual reference tracking frame. And this is an example of the, uh, a marker that's a, a universal uh, tool tracking marker. So right now we're completely agnostic to uh, the type of instrumentation that the surgeon chooses to use. So uh, we've heard multiple times, we use the Gertzman grading criteria. This, cri this has to do with the degree of pedicle breach that exists. A and B are considered, considered acceptable, uh, clinically accurate place screws, meaning less than two millimeters of breach, independent of which direction the breach occurred. We also use the HERI grading criteria. In the interest of time, we're not going to go through it. Uh, but needless to say, we had two independent neuroradiologists at two different institutions that have no affiliation. Uh, with the study whatsoever or the group, uh, greater screws independently. <clears throat> so in terms of clinical accuracy for now or newer software, newer hardware, for 113 of our total implants, independent of what scale we used, we had a 99.12% uh, accuracy. 100% accuracy for all the gem sheet needles that we placed. And then when we broke it down in terms of the screws, we had 98.9% accuracy. If we substratify based on lumbar and thoracic, for lumbar, 100% accuracy for all the implants, 100% obviously for the gym sheety, 100% for the screws. When we look at thoracic, not, independent of what scale we use, 98% accuracy on both scales, 100% for the gym sheety needles, and 98% uh, for the uh, thoracic screws. Really, to summarize that, one of the screws that was uh, placed was, had a three millimeter breach medially. And the rest of all the screws were perfectly without any type of breach. But we know that these great accuracy rates that I'm presenting, it's unlikely that make, this makes any clinical uh, difference or significance, right? <clears throat> so I'm more interested in validating the position of the system because the, the reason I got into computer navigation and augmented reality was not because we wanted to put in better pedicle screws. We started working on this on 3D segmentation to create a system that was better than what we had to guide high precision osteotomy cuts to do M block tumor resections. So what I'm really interested in is in precision, right? So the people have had different uh, schematics of this graph today. So you can be low accuracy, high precision, meaning you're landing on the you're landing at the same place every time, but it turns out you're never hitting your target. Low accuracy, low precision, you're invariably landing and you're never hitting your target. High accuracy or low precision means you're hitting the target, your clinically accurate target every time, but you're not actually very precise into where you thought you were landing and where you actually landed. And where you want to be is high accuracy and high precision. You want to hit the target every time and you want to reliably hit the target where you thought you hit the target. And so how does this translate clinically? or how could it potentially translate clinically? So to study this, every time that we had the surgeons participating in our study, 
once they were done placing their screw, we, they would pause and we would document in three-dimensional space where that screw was. So where your virtual screw, we would record that and then we would figure out its three-dimensional position. Then we took a post-op CT scan and we used the MITK software to pixel by pixel calculate the position in three-dimensional space in the tip of the screw distally and proximally as well as, well as its angular position within that pedicle. Using that, we're able to calculate tip deviation and angular deviation. Complex mathematics, I'm not going to go through it, but needless to say, our friends in the FDA tell us that you need to have less than three millimeters screw tip deviation and a less than three degrees angular deviation. So why is that important? So let's say that this is your phantom screw trajectory here. You know, you have an angle uh, to this line and it's 4.2 degrees. That's, just, that's where you thought you were placing the screw. That's what it looked like on your phantom projection. But if you have a three millimeter deviation in reality, what your screw looks like on a CT scan may be a screw that's actually partially going through the lateral recess of that canal. Maybe you, that's not clinically significant. Maybe you don't have to revise that screw. But this has to do with position, where your screws are not always ending up exactly where you thought they ended up when you take these post-op CT scans. And we see that all the time with modern computer navigation. So how did we do? Our screws had a mean uh, screw tip deviation altogether of 1.97 millimeters, which is statistically significantly lower than 3 millimeters. And when we broke it down in thoracic and sacral lumbar, we saw that same relationship hold. Again, when we look at our angular deviation, we're statistically significantly lower than the 3 degrees quite a bit. All screws had a 1.3 millimeter, uh, I'm sorry, 1.3 degree radian deviation. And that relationship held regardless of whether the thoracic or sacral lumbar be placed. <clears throat> so in conclusion, I really think that a head-mounted display that's lightweight, that is miniaturizes an entire computer workstation into something that's very small and portable is the natural progression of our navigation technology. I don't think it competes with robotics. I think it will only integrate when, as robotics gets more advanced and we take the data that we're seeing on our image guided robotics and place it on our heads and it's not gonna be much different than uh, wearing a headlight. It's clini clinically accurate and precise and it's something that's gonna open the door not for placing hardware that you're already good at placing. It's gonna open the door for you to be able to do a lot of the work that you're doing uh, in a much more intuitive way and a rapid learning curve, right? We're trying to de-skill procedures that are potentially very technically deleterious to a patient. Um, and it's ultimately cost conscious. We held multiple times today about the concern that some of these very expensive technologies that we're developing in America and Europe are shifting us further and further away from the developing world. I can tell you that miniaturizing this into the size that it is now, it's extremely cost conscious and factorially cheaper than any of the solutions that exist out there. Uh, so I'd like to thank uh, my mentors at the Carnegie Center for Surgical Innovation that basically didn't laugh at me when we wanted to come up with uh, this project. Rush University Medical Center that facilitated our uh, last cadaveric study. Uh, the entire Augmetics team that has grown from just a few people at the very beginning of this to now a, a massive team of very talented engineers um, uh, and uh, representatives who are out there in the field getting surgeon feedback on how we can make this technology better. Uh, my clinical mentors, Dr. Witham, Dr. Shuba, and Dr. Theodore, as well as uh, new collaborators, Dr. Phillips, Dr. Ku, Dr. Polster, and Dr. Coleman. Thank you. Thank you. That was uh, really nice. So, uh, any questions? Yes. Yes, yeah, Dr. Edstrom. So thank you for the talk. Um, there are some publications on inattention when you use these uh, head-mounted displays, where you, uh, where you focus on uh, what is displayed rather than reality, and uh, that they've done tests where you, where you miss the bleeding, uh, basically. And uh, so how do you address this when you have something in, in your field of vision constantly? Yeah, so um, that was actually one of, that's a very insightful and a great question. That was one of the questions that the FDA had for us uh, during some of our initial meetings with them. And they were concerned that not having seen the system, that whatever image was displayed 
uh, through the uh, direct retinal display was occlusive of the field. So it's almost like you're wearing blinders. So what's the point of that, right? Uh, but we physically went and showed them the system and the system is translucent. So the image is overlaid in a fashion that you're still able to see everything that's going on in the surgical field. And that, that is one of the primary goals of this is that you don't lose sight of what it is that you're actually doing and what your hands are doing. And in the event that you still think that the image that's being displayed through the direct retinal display, we're able to turn down the intensity and ultimately through a foot switch or voice control, it completely turn it off when you don't need it. Mike. How do you deal with um, depth in terms of the graphical rep representation and, and knowing where your, your instrument is and, and the, the different layers that you might be encountering? For instance, the you know, a very stenotic patient that has no epidural fat and there's previous surgery, there's no ligament there and you're coming through bone mass and then there's dura on the other side of it. How, how is that transmitted into a imaging representation and what, do you, how do you find that? So are you saying in terms of using the system to yeah. actually do a decompression or something like that? Or an osteotomy or you're anywhere where you're coming through, you know, and you really want to be conscious of depth. You know, whereas in, with your eye, you start to, see, you, you know, you see things getting thin when you're wafing through bone with, with a drill or you feel that with a, uh, you know, a, a, some sort of ultrasonic bone scalpel. How are you doing that with okay. graphical representation? So in all transparency, we have not done anything yet in, with any sort of validation other than the placement of hardware. But again, that's to validate how precise the system is and able to, and able to track your instruments. Now, that being said, we are working to do it's through machine learning, we're basically teaching the system how to identify at the most basic sense an osteotomy. So that overlaid onto your field, the system will say, this is where you should do your osteotomy. And it might even tell you how many degrees of correction you're gonna get for that osteotomy. Now it's gonna overlay where you think it should where you should do that osteotomy, but it doesn't mean that you should use the system to actually do it on the three-dimensional model. It's something that you turn it off and then you do it and still use you know, the same surgical you know, active visual feedback that you would otherwise. Um, now, if you're doing something MIS and through a tube, um, you know, we're looking to integrate the same type of technologies and solutions that Dr. Hartles talked about where you have an overlay of the actual anatomy, but it's not occlusive. It just gives you, you know, general guidelines of where you should be doing that work, but you're still doing it through direct visualization and not on a 3D model where, like you said, it's going to be very difficult to tease out some of those three-dimensional depth relationships. So you'll be able to just toggle? Wait, toggle on and off extremely wait. fast, yeah. Yes, yeah, Raj. I have a question, too, in general. In terms of this feature, Dr. point about osteotomy, you know, when you do anything, like you put a, when you put an implant in, like let's say you put in a lateral cage, I mean, obviously, I understand the applications are trying to expand it further because right now it's, it's validating the pedicle screw placement, right? So I'm saying in the future, when you put in implants and the relationships of the vertebrae change relative to one another, right? So if you do a deformity correction, for instance, is there anything in the system right now as it stands that it can account for those variabilities? So I, I love that question. And you're not a planted member in the audience because that's my favorite thing. So. The reason that I love what we're developing is because the camera that we're working on is a smart camera that's directly with the surgical field, not a remote camera that can't see anything other than a reference frame and a tool marker. So if you're doing an open surgery, and again, this is not for MIS work, if you're doing an open surgery, our cameras right now, is, this is not out yet, but what we're working on is able to do surface matching. So as the spine is changing, it's taking the bony anatomy that it's seeing and matching it to a pre-op CT and doing segmental surface registration. And it's able to realign itself based on the segmental changes that you're doing, not through CT-based navigation. It's all optical computer vision. So this is a system that's integrating all of the bells and whistles that you're seeing out there, 70 surgical, uh, fluoroscopy, 3D navigation, and we're trying to bridge that all together to be able to give you something that's very active and seamless. All right, I think we'll move on. Uh, yes, a quick comment or just a, a comment. Um, when we've tried to look, we call it technical accuracy, trying to look at the millimeter deviation from, from plan. And in our experience, if you place large pedicle screws, uh, they will grab onto the pedicle and then they will sort of shift to follow the axis of the, of the pedicle. So 
if uh, if your plan is not perfectly aligned with that, or or the screw is uh, perhaps uh, uh, large compared to the pedicle, you will you will have a deviation, which is not necessarily inaccuracy, but it's really good surgery, good fixation. Any comment on that? Because you had really nice numbers. Yeah, so we used pretty, 5.5 millimeters, we used actually pretty large uh, screws for some of our upper mid thoracic screws that we, or pedicles that we ended up cannulating. Um, and we took a lot of care in, you know, making sure that we trust the system and didn't change our initial trajectories and just trust the system. And our, as you saw, our accuracy and precision ended up being that on, despite the fact that you set yourself up to potential deviations and uh, accuracy and precision if you have a large screw that, you know, bounces off a cortical wall. And for that, we used, you have, it's even better if you use power, you'll get even better results. And for this study, we actually didn't use power, but I can tell you that when we do use power, I think the data will look even better. All right, great. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank that was great.